like every other person No one knows who's out there Everybody else agrees Hey, what's up, YouTube guys? So this is uh, Dan here with uh, DNS Creations. Uh, we've got Steve on here. Uh, we're doing uh, this collaboration uh, on a video chat remotely because our schedules are conflicting. So uh, typically, in, the fa in a fashion, we would be doing the same video in the same room. But since we're across the country, that can't be done right now. So, uh, Steve. Hey, you know what? It works out. We're going to be able to show you guys some interesting things on Fusion 360. We're going to talk about our rockets. We're going to splice it in with the clips. We're going to make a real good video regardless. So, I don't know. Let's get this thing started. So, up first, I'm actually going to show our E30. That's our HE rocket. The uh, HE rocket is a 75 millimeter rocket. It uses a small diameter rocket motor, and it uses a boost charge to fire it out of the tube like an RPG continues on rocket exhaust, hits the target, explodes. That's the uh, that's the idea behind it. And it's supposed to be just a good fun rocket. It doesn't serve a real practical purpose. It's not going to knock out a vehicle. But, you know, we printed off a bunch of these things, and we really wanted to try them out at Ordnance Lab. So without further ado, I can share that with you if you'd like. Yeah, go ahead and pop it up on the screen. All right, let me know when you've got it on your end there. It's thinking real hard. There it is. Okay, now we can see it. All right. So up on the screen here, you're going to see this is the E30 round as we brought it to Ordnance Lab. So here we have the small diameter rocket motor and the tail shaft. This is where this would fit. Uh, this yellow area here, this is called the fuse channel. So these rounds, when they fire, the rocket exhaust ignites pyrotechnically a piece of quick match. And this quick match travels up to the detonator and it clears a path for the firing pin of the detonator. So that way, when the rocket impacts something, the detonator, the inertial detonator can slam forward on the primer. It can set off our little nine mil uh, cap, which is full of flash powder, setting off the primary charge. So a couple... Uh, issues that we had with this rocket here at Ordnance Lab. This rocket is really, it's a little bit tall for an Ender 3, which is what we started printing with. We don't print much on Ender 3s anymore, but it didn't fit the volume as is in the full length. Um, so we had to have a joint here. This joint, uh, I like to call it like a clover joint. Basically, it's just a dowel with three pins to clock it. So that way the fuse would be clocked in the correct direction. These are like alignment pins. And these alignment pins would mate the upper and bottom surfaces. We'd basically put epoxy on this flange here that's highlighted. And we'd put some epoxy on this flange here that's highlighted. And then all around the stub. And we would mate it together. The problem is um, this is recoilously fired. So over here, we have an H195 cartridge. It's actually the same cartridge we would use for the E30. And in this dark area here, that is where the boost charge would go. And then on this gold piece right here, this is where the uh, secondary boost charge would go. And using two boost charges was a little ambitious because um, it was popping these things out with so much force that probably 70% of them or so actually sheared. Either they would fail at the joint, but what I'm seeing in the video is they might have been breaking right here at the motor shaft. And... Uh, that's a problem. So obviously you're not going to deliver the warhead if it's breaking in half. Not every one of them broke in half, but we're we're going to do to rectify that is we've got a new version right here. And if you can see the highlighted area, can you still see this here, Dan? Yeah, I still can. Perfect. So this highlighted area, this is all now one piece. So we've switched production of this round to our FL Sun printer, which prints in a, a higher Z-axis volume. And now we can put this all in one print without a joint. And the other thing that we're going to do is we're no longer going to include the secondary boost charge. Um, it was kind of overkill. It didn't really need it. This thing gets hummed out at like 150 miles an hour before the rocket takes over and accelerates it even faster. So the extra boost charge, all it was doing was damaging the launcher or breaking the rockets. These are 3D printed. We're running in the limitations of 3D printed plastic here. And these aren't supposed to be anything super serious anyway. They're just supposed to deliver a round on target, explode, good fun, smiles by all. Some of the changes that we've made. Um, 
the rocket that we did have hit, it passed through the plywood backstop. So we want to make them a little more sensitive, right? So what we used to have in our design, we got rid of it. Now we're going to bring it back was we had a much longer detonator. We shrank the detonator down for space con considerations, but now we're going to put this ball bearing back into the detonator. The detonator, I don't have it pulled up here, but basically this ball bearing is going to add inertia to the firing pin and that's going to um, make the firing pin more sensitive against impact. The other thing we have is basically we've gone from a hollow nose cone here to a nose plug, right? So the base of this is solid and we're going to print this at 100% infill. It's going to be a completely solid chunk of plastic. And then right here, we're going to put our detonator in from the top of the round instead of from the bottom. And then we're going to cap it off with this. And this piece here, this is the detonator cap. It's going to be filled 100% infill with plastic too. So what we want to do is we want to transfer the impact energy from the round striking its object straight into that detonator because we want all of that inertia to go into driving that firing pin into the into the primer and setting off the round. So this guy here, he lives on top of the detonator. We're going to slide it over, just slide over this body here like so. So basically the detonator will go in there, we'll slide the cap over it, we'll fill up this remaining volume. It's gonna be about 65 grams or so. And then we're gonna put the nose plug on and that's gonna provide one really solid impact to the detonator. Uh, what else? That's probably it. That's the summary of changes for the E30. Dan, what do you think about those changes? Man, I think there's some good improvements. Um... Of course, as you explained, uh, we're all reaching the limitations of a printable plastic. Rather, it's a PLA, PLA plus. We've gone through carbon fiber, nylon. We've done ABS. Uh, we've done PETG. And it's just we're we're finding the limitations of what the, the material is. So we're having to alter a lot of our designs. Um, and we've had a handful of failures. The failures are part of something. We learned a lot from this. We learned what the weakness points are um, and how to make all the changes that Steve has just shown you on here. So we're we're getting pretty confident that the uh, we're getting close to being at a at a final design on this. Um, of course there's still gonna be some more tweaks that we have to do, but we won't know that till we go back out and work with the guys at Ordnance Lab again. That's right. One more thing I'd like to bring up. I actually have um, since we redesigned the E30, we actually are also going to make it a dual purpose round. Um, Sean over at our Ordnance Lab really wants us to put together a mortar, and I figured, well, we basically already got a mortar here, and what I've designed is a gas piston. So this here is basically a ported piston. It's going to slide into a three-inch diameter tube, and it's going to go on top of a black powder charge, and this is going to cushion the blow so that all that force is delivered in a slow metered amount through these gas ported holes in order to produce what they call like a, a high low charge, which basically the high pressure converts to a long duration, low pressure um, propulsive charge, which will provide a good loft for the mortar, but it's also not going to destroy it in the tube as we send it out. So that's gonna be neat when we get to follow up uh, one more time with Ordnance Lab. We're gonna try to send these out as mortars as well. So that'll be fun to have a nice little indirect fire project because you know what? The ground is a really big target and they're all gonna hit it and go boom. <laughs> yeah, a very high success rate, we hope. Oh yeah. So uh, next up, I guess we'll talk about our H195. Which is this the round is the you one see here. Everyone probably wants to know about. Yep. This is the big bad boy. So this is our heat round. This was powered by a 60 pound thrust rocket engine, um, much bigger than and anything in the E30, and uh, twice the size of the rocket motor that uh, we tested on our first heat round attempt at Ordnance Lab. That one didn't go so well. That rocket was really underwhelming and underpowered. Uh, this is kind of uh, basically version two of our heat round. We also have version three, which we're about to unveil to you um, for our next uh, next outing. Um, it's incorporating all the design changes and all the improvements um, that we've come up with for the H195 round. And it's gonna incorporate all of them, plus it's way simpler, but let's just go into this one. Um, this, can you see these, uh, can you see this pretty well, Dan, on your side? You can see these baffles. 
Uh, the the baffles are they're they're fair, but they're uh, you can see them. Yes. Yeah. Let me see if I can split this for the audience. I'm gonna split splitting two. Do do do. Extend splitting two. Oh, we almost we almost split 21 bodies. That wouldn't have been good. Yeah. Hopefully fusion doesn't have an autistic fit on me right now. It kind of does get slow at times and hang up. All right, so here we go. So here you can see the base of the rocket. The rocket motor is not installed in this fusion model here. But uh, basically, the rocket exhaust would be here. We have our boost charge. The cardboard tube is not illustrated, but it lives inside here. We have our fuse channel with the holes in it. And then we have our secondary boost charge, as you can see here, inside the countermass housing. Countermass housing, that is packed with uh, either corn syrup solids or uh, iron oxide or whatever we want to counter the mass of the rocket. So that way, when this boost charge was to ignite, it would propel the rocket out one way and the countermass the other way. Well, one of the problems we faced, actually a significant problem we faced, is that while the countermass system, recoil system worked excellent on the E30 or the HE rockets, that didn't work at all on the 195. So basically the 195 has a really, really hot igniter. And it needs a really hot igniter because it takes a long time for such a uh, extremely long fuel grain to ignite and burn, or excuse me, to ignite and build case pressure for that rocket to make thrust and take off. Compared to the E30, which is a really short motor, it gets cooking like that. So what was happening was the igniter would uh, pop and it would let out a small amount of uh, pressure, heat, and flame, and that would launch a boost charge, which would poop this round out really weakly for this large round um, onto the ground. And then five seconds later, the rocket engine would take off. It resulted in disaster. About three times this rocket just basically struck the ground, broke into pieces, and then you'd have a loose motor just going all over the place. It was bad. So what we decided to do um, for our remaining rounds was we basically kept the cartridge because we needed a way to keep the fins folded so we could insert the rocket into the tube, but we discarded the boost charge because this rocket motor is so powerful that it it doesn't need a boost charge. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, absolutely. The uh, the, the rocket motor that we picked for this, uh, this 195 is, it's like it's on steroids in comparison to the other smaller rockets that we've made. It's... Um, it's incredibly impressive. Yeah. And uh, a couple other design considerations, uh, improvements. So right here we have our folding fins. As you can see, um, I'm not sure what I even call these, these grooves here. What would you call these, Dan? Uh, I don't know. A, a, alignment? Yeah, there grooves. we go. <laughs> yeah. Alignment and grooves. Yeah, we've got these alignment grooves on the body of the rocket, as you can see here. And the whole purpose of those is so when the fins are in the folded con uh, condition, they can't snag and have a fin fold sideways while the rocket's trying to exit the tube. So the clearance on those, a little bit snug. Uh, while it didn't present any any problems when we were static testing, just pulling the rocket, you know, pulling the rocket in and out. <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> How'd that go again? <laughs> it was pulling the rocket in and out of the tube. It didn't present any issues there. Um, however, you know, uh, when it came launch day, we had a few failures where some of these fins would not deploy. So uh, one of the changes we've made is we increase the clearance for these fin alignment rails, I guess. I don't know what to call them. We've increased the clearance, so that gives the fin more freedom to deploy. The other thing is um, we're hand winding these springs and I reclock the direction that the fin springs are wound in um, so that they have an extra half a turn of tension. So that's going to improve the, the fin deployment tension. Uh, another improvement we can talk about is right here. Same thing with the nose cone. This was a hollow nose cone. And as you can see, the detonator resides in this green area here and it has just a, a small layer of plastic to hold it in place um unless we hit a tank which we were not able to do the impact of hitting through 
plywood or whatnot, um, it wasn't sufficient to set this off. It didn't provide the deceleration needed to drive that firing pin into the primer. So even though you could take a detonator out of the rocket, throw it on the ground, it goes pop. Well, in the rocket, it wasn't going pop. Uh, anyway, we, we, we drove one through a sheet of plywood. It didn't go pop. So the design changes, again, are going to revolve around making the rocket more constitutionally sound and transferring that energy from impact into the detonator in a solid chain without any breakage of that chain, without any clearance, basically. All the parts are going to be butted up against each other. And, I mean, Dan, are you ready to talk about that? We're going to unveil this 550 here. Uh, let's save that for another video for these guys. Let's uh, let's keep some suspense for them. All right. Well, we do have the 550 ready to go. We got it on our Facebook page. There's a few clips uh, showing what it's like. It is a way more simplified rocket. However, I believe it's going to be a, an extremely effective rocket. So um, lots of really good changes coming from that. Um, we're talking about more power, more stability, more accuracy, better impact sensitivity, less parts, just a lot of good changes. So if that's that, I mean, we can wrap this up. 